Greetings all. Welcome to another session here of Tuesday Talks. We're going to continue our discussion of the Levy and Stockwell uh, text, and we're going to be looking at, at uh, using call in uh, research. And so today we're going to be looking at uh, the varieties of uh, different types of research that can be done with uh, computer-assisted language learning, uh, technology, and, and second language acquisition types of things. What's typically being done today and some suggestions uh, for developing and devising a research uh, plan for you to do research. Now, I realize that many of you are probably not going to be uh, involved in doing research as many of you are just trying to learn to use the technology so that you can become better teachers and be able to use all these new tools that are out there. But there are going to be some of you who are going to say, you know what, I want to research this. I want to find out which is better. Is A or better or B better or sh should I go back to the traditional? And I want to do some type of research. That's what this, uh, that's what this chapter and this little uh, mini lecture is all about. Okay. So, first of all, let's uh, take a look at our introduction here in Research in Call. Uh, it's generally conducted in relation to uh, language teaching and learning. Uh, uh, in other words, we're, people are out there doing research because they want to find out how they can teach better or how they can learn better. Uh, they're not necessarily looking at uh, you know, the quality of uh, the hardware or the software, or uh, they're not necessarily looking at how... Um, you know, language is being modified because of certain technologies. They're primarily doing this because they want to figure out how they can teach better or how students can learn better. Also, because we're dealing with so many different layers uh, in teaching now, we don't just have the student and the materials, but now we have another added layer of technology and the things that it can introduce. Um, it's generally done in, in uh, researchers today that it's a mixed method and they're very common. So we have qualitative and we have quantitative types of research. And just for those of you who don't know, qualitative is more narrative. There's more description of what's going on. Uh, whereas in quantitative, it's more numbers based. I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm doing t-tests and ANOVAs. I'm trying to get more hard statistics. Uh, I'm doing more number crunching when I do a quantitative type of study. A qualitative type of study is more like an ethnography or a, um, interviewing or s uh, possibly a survey uh, where you're trying to get a rich description of what's going on from a more word-based uh, type of a description. In mixed methods, you're going to try to use both. Uh, so that you can capture a variety of data from a variety of locations in order to try to gain credence, uh, add, um, add uh, security in the, in the conclusions that you're going to be reaching. So uh, mixed methods are probably going to be more common in this area simply because we're dealing with extra layers of uh, data that needs to be collected. One of the most common types of... Um, Researches that are done using technology are surveys or comparative studies. And on a survey, oftentimes you're asking the user, in this case it would be the student or the teacher, what they thought or how they felt or what they liked. And so uh, they're often used. So let's just say you create an activity. You, you, know, you create some activity using video and answering questions and, and you know, whatever it is, you create this activity and then you ask your students, well, what was good about it? Did you like it? Was it helpful? And you collect that data using a survey, uh, oftentimes used in research. And it's used for mostly surface purposes, for perceptions. Was it good? Wasn't it good? Uh, you're trying to get their uh, usability feel. There was How easy was it to use? Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's more of a qualitative type study, but it's ones that are being done often because teachers want to know, is this software helping you? Is this application useful to you? Do you find it engaging? Do you want to use it to continue learning language? Um, so that's one, one type of uh, study that's being done. Another type uh, of study that are being done are uh, comparative studies. Uh, we have uh, the old way versus the new way. We're going to use paper and pencil. We're going to use a word processor, or are we going to use a uh, uh, Google Google Docs type of thing, where I'm comparing two different types of systems and finding out which one is better, which one is going to be better for the student, uh, or for the teacher, or for or for whatever. And so we, we have these uh, comparing the old way versus the new way or comparing, you know, uh, tool A versus tool B, which is better or nicer. 
uh, and they're being done now because there's all these new tools that are that are popping up so you know you, you want to be able to find out which is better another type of comparative study is when they do control groups and test test groups uh, where you have a control group that doesn't get the treatment and you have a a test group that actually gets the treatment and so for example uh, we say that we have a um, we have uh, a reading assignment where a student can not only read the words but they can also hear the words okay which is a newer type of way so the control group they only get to read whereas the test group gets to read and hear it being read to them at the same time you know which one does better which one is is more productive which one is more engaging you do a little survey on that you could also test them afterwards uh, who gets a better score that's no longer qualitative now that's quantitative because I can actually count the numbers of uh, how, how one group did better or worse than the other so you've got those types of comparative studies that are going on using call. Give me some research examples. Again, this is out of uh, the Levy and Stockwell textbook. One was uh, a chat program where you had native and non-native speakers uh, chatting online. And this was mainly uh, by a researcher named uh, uh, Tudini. And this is a 2003 uh, research that was published, I believe. So you had native and non-native speakers, and they were chatting. And uh, Tudini wanted to find out about uh, their interaction and what was going on with the interaction. And it was, a, it was a mixed method study where you had qualitative data collected and quantitative data collected. And they were trying to analyze the conversations and looking for things like negotiation of meaning, uh, um, confidence building, um, and other types of uh, components that were going on there through the chat. Okay, so this is a technology that's being used to do some research uh, on uh, interaction between native and non-native speakers using um, a text program, a chat program. Another type of study out there that uh, has been done is uh, intercultural studies via email, where you use email to communicate back and forth, again, between native and non-native. This was also a, a mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative. Uh, the main article that, um, the main research that was uh, highlighted in the text was uh, by O'Dowd, who did uh, research uh, on this and found that uh, there were cultural elements that were being learned um, by the non-native speakers from the native speakers, and so you got to see this transfer. A lot of this research is also uh, sitting on top of the work by Warshower, who did a lot of work in the 1990s. Uh, he was one of the forerunners of a lot of this uh, research on technology, on, um, on using things like email and, and, uh, and the like. So he was very big into this. And anyway, the research was done, and, and uh, so that's one area where you can, again, take a look and see how they'd set up a research and what were the results and the benefits of, of using email in this sense. Another study uh, example is reading on the web and tracking the behavior of, uh, of the students. And uh, so there was uh, some customized uh, analysis software that was being done. And uh, some of these actually did analysis of reading. Uh, reading on the web and uh, literally eye motions and hand motions and mouse capturing. and So there was specialized capture software that was introduced so that they could analyze these things. Uh, this is definitely more robust and obviously would take a little extra work for the typical researcher, but they wanted to track the benefits of, uh, of reading on the web and what was going on, what were the actual things that were happening. Another uh, type of research uh, by, I think it was Pajola, who was talking about using feedback and getting help and then tracking what the students actually did. So they would provide feedback, they would provide help for the students, but did the students actually use the help? Okay, and if they did use the help, how was it being used? What segments were being used, and how could it be more appropriately uh, uh, used in future? Uh, just think about it. You, as a as a as a computer user, you've got help all over the place. You know, people, uh, uh, me as a, as a, as a tech teacher, I'm amazed that students uh, don't know shortcuts because uh, I use them all the time. Cut, copy, paste, open, save. Uh, I use them all the time. And I'm amazed that people don't know how to use them when they are clearly visible in almost any browser, almost any application that you, that you uh, look at. So the, the help is there, 
but people don't know that. And when I show them, they can use this quick key to, to save or to, uh, or to print. They're like, oh, wow, I didn't know you could do that. It's been sitting there. So this research that they were doing is actually a good research. You may provide help and you may provide feedback, but is it actually going to be useful? Okay, and that was their research that uh, Pajola and I believe uh, Heift also did something like that in uh, 2002. The last example here is uh, annotation design and how well is annotation being used uh, and which ones are better and which ones are worse. And uh, I'm going to go over to the browser here and just show you some annotation type systems. Uh, they had a control group there as well, and they had uh, a couple of hypotheses trying to decide which annotation system was better. And uh, so they had some hypotheses that were set up. They based everything on, on uh, some, some, theolo some um, theoretical framework, and then they decided to test these. Will the people using this system do better or not? And then, of course, which one was more often used? Uh, and so that was their design. And just to let you know, annotation and uh, uh, lookups are great tools for a language learner. I'm going to run over to the browser here real quick. And uh, I've included a couple of, uh, um, what do we call these? A couple of add-ins. Uh, if you go to your browser, and uh, I'm in Firefox, and you click on Tools, you'll see something there called Add-ons. And if you go to Add-ons, Tools, Add-ons, uh, you see all these different types of things that you can add on to your browser. There are hundreds of thousands of these add-ons, things that you can add onto your browser to make your browser go faster or nicer or better. So we've got something called AutoPager. Let me just do a quick show you what AutoPager does, uh, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. So let's, let me just go to do a, a search here for uh, something. Just look up a word, uh, you know, like, like bananas, and I'm going to scroll down. When I get down to the bottom of the page, all of a sudden you're going to see there's page two. I didn't have to do a search for it. It auto-paged to the next search window, to the next search page. I get down to page three, and there automatically it's there, page three. It's automatically loading every page. Okay, It's an auto-pager. Automatically goes to the next page. So I can sit here and press the control key, or if you're a Mac guy, click, press the, the, um, the uh, command key, and just click, 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 and all these new tabs are going to open up because the auto pager just lets me go to the next page. Now I'm on page four. Go to the next page, and go to the next page, and go to the next page. That's an auto pager. It's a great little tool, a great little add-on that you can have. There's a whole bunch of auto pagers. I've got a bunch of them listed here that you can look at. Okay, and also these uh, little add-ons are great pieces for you to uh, to play with and learn. Uh, uh, to make your, your browsing better, but they can also be used for teaching. They can also be resources that you can say, oh, I want to research this. So one of the things that I know that's been done with regard to uh, vocabulary are, are uh, mouse overs. So I've installed a couple of mouse overs. I just want to show you how they work. Um, here's a, a story out of, uh, what is this, Investor's Business Daily. And that's all I'm going to do is put my, my mouse over a word and it's going to identify that word. And you'll see here that this is actually in, uh, in Japanese because uh, that's how this one is set up. So I can go over a word and I see a definition. It just pops up. And I can now use this information if I want or click on a definition. I've got a definition also in English here, a variety of information that's sitting here. Oh, I can learn new words as I'm reading. So if I'm reading this article, in fact, let's blow this article out into a full-fledged page. And I can use this mouse over to do study. Now, I may want to decide, gee, is this going to help my students learn Japanese or learn English, or isn't it? And I can use this um, to do that. I mean, that's not coming up, so let's go to this uh, example here. Here's another story of, uh, it's just a short story. Okay, and I'm just going to put my mouse over a word, and I'm going to start getting words. I'm not going to get all of them. Like if you noticed, uh, what was that, wildflowers. I doubt that'll pop up. But I, most of these words are going to pop up, right? And I'll be able to, re so I can read along, and I'm like, oh, I don't know what this word is. Put my mouse over it. Oh, that's what it means. And then I can go back to reading if I want, move my mouse away. That's a mouse over with uh, dictionary definitions. It's a great tool to have. How well does it help students learn? Is it going to help them to learn language better or not better? 
Uh, is it going to be a better thing if I if I uh, you know if I use uh, if I use just Google and I type in you know something like define and then haze and then I press enter in a Google search and it gives me the meaning. Okay, and do I use that and then go back to my story or is the mouse over going to be better? You know, is this going to be a distraction or isn't it that type of thing? Now, there's a research thing that you can do. There's a variety of these types of tools that are sitting out there. Uh, that you can use. Like I said, there's uh, thousands of add-ons inside uh, Firefox. There are hundreds of add-ons inside Google Chrome. Uh, and some of them are great tools. And so as far as research opportunities, there are a lot of things that are out there that can be done for you to do research on related to call and second language learning, second language acquisition. Uh, okay, Levy and Stockwell make some suggestions here as far as if you're going to be doing a research, make sure that your research is deeply embedded in literature. Don't just willy-nilly go do a study. Find out what other people have done first. Go do your legwork and find out what's, in, what's going on in there. If you're going to be doing a study, make sure that you have some sort of conceptual framework. Okay, Don't just do your research and then say, okay, I'm going to go look at this. Base it on some framework that's already out there. We've already talked about some of those in uh, earlier lectures, but you should want to do that. You should try to include um, a hypothesis. Now, not everybody does that. Some people do research that basically says, we're going to let students try this and see what happens. Now, that's a valid research. Um, it would be better if you could have some sort of a null hypothesis. You have a hypothesis that says, we believe this, and then you test it. Um, that's the more traditional way that you do it. If you're going to be doing a research, again, they recommend that you do that. You include um, some sort of a, uh, a disprovable, I'm sorry, yeah, disprovable hypothesis. Because you're going to be doing research that involves technology, there's a whole bunch of things that you need to define. Typically, when you do research uh, with, with language learners, you need to describe who your language learners are. Who are the participants in the study? You know, their age, their background, their, maybe their learning style, different things like that. You may also want to dis describe um, what it is that you're testing, what it is that you're learning. But in the case of call, you also have to describe the learning environment, the technology you're using, whether it's web-based or computer-based, you know, whether it's mobile or a phone or, you know, you have to describe the software. You have to describe uh, how it's being used and describe the hardware that's being used with it. So it's, again, it's an added layer of description and you need to, you should describe all those parts. Okay. Again, the reason why, so that someone can duplicate your work, see if it's valid, and also that in case someone wants to actually enact what you've done, they have a recipe set up because you've described everything. Uh, you also should describe uh, what the student wants to do with this software. Okay, so again, that's an added layer uh, that you're going to want to have to describe. Uh, they suggest that you should use mul multiple uh, modes of capturing data. That means you're going to be capturing data that's not only qualitative, but also quantitative. You want to triangulate, okay, as, uh, as uh, shoot, I forget their name, M Miles and Mitchell would say. You, you want to be able to triangulate your data collection, some, some that's qualitative, some that's quantitative, and, uh, and have different layers of data. Um, so that you can more, more appropriately uh, certify what it is that you're getting to your conclusion. You should try to include a rich description. Again, rich description is going to be more qualitative. And if possible, try to include a tracking system. Now, you're not going to be able to capture everything. Again, there are, there are applications out there that actually capture eye movements. You know, when someone is reading, you know, if they go forward and backwards or how many times they go forward and back, that's a capture system. Most of you aren't going to have access to that type of software. But the more you can capture, the more interesting your data is going to be, the more you can come to a better uh, conclusion if you have some type of uh, a tracking system. Well, there's, there's, those are their suggestions. Okay, some other suggestions, make sure that you uh, avoid some potential problems within the research. The example that they give, which I would agree with, are that surveys are limited. Um, survey is good information, but it's also a perception. What did you feel? What did you think? And people's perceptions can change from day to day, from morning to afternoon. You were tired, you were hungry, you had a bad day. 
and you didn't like the technology as much. Or the technology was new and this was awesome, you know, because somebody likes technology. So you've got uh, some limitations that are going on there. You also have some unfounded assumptions. Anything tech is good. I don't know if you've met those people, but they're out there. Um, and so there are other people who say all tech is bad. And so they've got some assumptions that are going on that aren't necessarily true. Another problem might be the problem of uh, defining a word. Um, people talk about hybrid education or traditional education. Uh, and what does that mean exactly? Uh, when is hybrid online? When is uh, hybrid in class? Um, it, 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 okay, so you, you want to have them defined. For me, the, the big word that I used to always enjoy using was course content management system or CCMS. Uh, and I'm all pleased to use that, but unfortunately, more and more people are not using CCMS. They're using CMS, Content Management System, or Course Management System. The problem is, of course, CMS now can have two meanings, Course Management System and Content Management System. So that, to me, was difficult. I wanted to use CCMS, but that's not the way it's going. Okay? The terms that are being defined can be vague, and they can change. Make sure that you define them when you're doing a research. Uh, try not to use broad brush uh, comparisons. Try not to have the, the step back and have this big comparison because it's not going to be very helpful uh, in, in the end. You're going to have this big comparison that A is bigger than B type of thing, but you're not going to be able to use it specifically to help someone improve their language learning or improve their language teaching. Some uh, things that you can be doing with research. One is you can start looking at some new skills because they have new technology. Just like the one I showed you earlier with the mouse overs, you have uh, new opportunities that you can do and uh, with these new technologies, but that means that students are going to be doing new things with them. Those are areas where you can do research. The roles as well. There's the greater role right now of uh, student learner participation. They are doing more. You as a teacher are going to be doing less. Okay, as far as actual input, actual being in up front in the classroom, as it were. You're more of a, of a facilitator, a guide on the side, as I had mentioned before. Uh, because there's more that's going on in the learning process. There's more ownership now from the learner standpoint, and that's a good thing. But you can evaluate, assess that in a research area. There's also the broader view of learning. Learning is no longer you know, a book or a teacher, but you've now got different uh, possibilities for the student to learn via different modes with different people, not necessarily in the classroom. So the view of learning is now different. I, mean, I don't know uh, if you all have heard about flipped education, where you now watch a video first and then you go do your activities, practice activities. It's happening in a lot of schools. Um, throughout the country, uh, this whole idea of flipped education. But that's, that's a broader view of learning. It's not the same way that it used to be. Another big thing that you need to be aware of is that it's going to require training. It's going to require training you, for you, the teacher. It's going to require training for students. They need to learn how to use these technologies. And in my opinion, this is not good for classroom teachers because classroom teachers want to teach their content be it math or science or history or literature uh, or language. And now added on top of this, you have to learn the technology. You as a teacher have to learn it, and then your students have to learn how to use it so they can take advantage of it. There's a lot of new things that are going on with training that you're going to need to know, and uh, possibly you could also do research on what type of training is good, but it will require training. All right, uh, last thing here that I uh, wanted to delve into is whether we do research on the skills and the databases. And by the skills, I'm talking about the four primary skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And the two databases are primarily grammar and uh, vocabulary. I mean, there are a couple other databases that we could talk about, um, the more of the sociocultural um, uh, elements. But those are the primary ones. Do we study the four skills? Do we study the two databases? Do we study everything together? Uh, do we break it down? Okay, And you can do any of those, to be honest. There are people who want to study and focus on just vocabulary. They just want to focus on writing. Uh, and that's certainly possible. Right? There's, no, there's no yes or no with this. Some people prefer doing more of the linguistic 
research end, and there are others who prefer doing the you know the whole language type of uh, approach. That's going to be up to you. Just make sure that you have the appropriate uh, ma you know materials and the appropriate breakdown of, of all the components that you're going to need if you're going to do this st whatever study you're going to do. There is no yes or no, right or wrong with that. It can be done. Some people like uh, individual things. Other people want to do more of an ethnographic and put it all together type of deal. All right. Lastly, optimal design. What's the best design for your study? Well, make sure that it fits your research objectives. Um, if you're going to be researching something that's small, your design is not going to necessarily be so big. If you're going to be researching a larger block of information, you know, let's just do this for example. You're going to be doing um, a, a one-time event, or you're going to be doing an event that you do multiple times. Uh, is it a one-time reading event, or are you going to be doing? You're going to be taking snapshots of reading throughout the entire semester, and you might have 20 or 30 different snapshots that you're now looking at. Well, that's a lot more data. Okay, so you're going to be doing a comparison of all these different snapshots. It's going to be a lot more data that you're going to have to connect, collect. In any event, make sure that the objectives are going to fit uh, the way you set up the the design. Make sure that you have a lot of collected data. Um, my thought is to collect a lot of data and you may not use it. That's fine. You may use it later. You may discover that what you were intending on researching isn't as interesting as something else that you happen to discover because you've collected extra data. Which is also why I would say not only you know are you going to collect different samples as you go through time, but you can try to collect different layers. You can, for example, analyze um, a writing as far as what a student wrote, but you can also at talk to them about what they wrote about. You can also talk to the person who reviewed or assessed that. And so now you've got three different perspectives on a paper. Oh, that's going to be more data collected. But you're going to need the tools to do it. You're going to need to be able to analyze that or have people analyze that for you. Lastly, you should try to contain uh, include both quantitative and qualitative. One, because again, you have triangulation, you have more uh, believable data. Uh, but two, there are people out in the you know call research world that are mostly quantitativists. They think that that's more reliable. And you've got the other side, quantitativists, who believe that the numbers are more reliable. Well, if you do a triangulated, you're going to be able to please both. Uh, and especially if they they complement each other, it's going to be better that way. So my bet, my guess would always be include both sets of data if you're going to be designing. That's actually what Sto uh, Levy and Stockwell would say as well. Okay, some um, recap. Some future research um, that they suggest that we might want to look into is understanding some of the attitudes, the perceptions towards technology. That's being done now, but it certainly can continue to be done. We can do research on call characteristics and how it is as opposed to face-to-face -face type of uh, language learning. So again, we're doing the comparison. Uh, one big study, and I would agree with this, the need and the, and the impact of training uh, students to use these technologies or the training that teachers need to learn these technologies. Um, if teachers know this, if teachers see the, the impact of it, the benefit of it, they're going to be more interested in learning those new tools. If they're not going to see a difference, if they see that the training doesn't do much, well then they're going to say, why am I doing this? And that, that would be a good thing that I would be interested in seeing as far as research. Setting up more theoretical models. That takes a bigger, you need to step back and look at the whole and see how that model might be different than what it is. That's a harder work, um, but still needs to be done. Uh, research on the units of evaluation. As I mentioned before, you're do talking about somebody who's doing uh, reading, uh, of, uh, reading skills, and you take a snapshot at the beginning, and you take a snapshot in the middle, and you take a snapshot at the end. And uh, how many of these units are you taking, and how many of these units are you evaluating? You know, years ago, uh, in college or in graduate school, you might have two exams in a class, uh, or one exam in a class that covered everything, and it was just one snapshot, as opposed to taking multiple snapshots. Of course, you take multiple snapshots, what do you have to do? You have to compare them all. You have to do a lot more analysis with them. Okay, so that would be another thing that could be done. Learner differences is uh, constantly being done, and obviously should still be done as we continue to move forward with new tools, new technologies. Um, next one they have on their list here is inclusive research designs uh, or uh, single database systems. Which one should you do? I don't know that that's necessarily 
uh, a research area. That's just a, a, a preference, in my opinion, to the research. Whatever you do, make sure that you make sure the uh, whatever you do, make sure that the research is manageable. Um, part of the problem that people have when they do a research is they bite off more than they can chew. And they have this idea, oh, I want to do this type of research. And it just becomes this mound of analysis that they have to look at. And they get scared or tired and, you know, they give up. Make sure that what you're doing is doable. Um, in the words of Bob, baby steps. There are times where you want to have baby steps. <laughs> Remember uh, the purpose for doing your research, okay? Another good reason why you have your hypotheses, because you can always go back and test against those. But remember that purpose and remember your objective as you're collecting the data. That doesn't mean that when you write your paper, you necessarily use that. But you should always remember what that is. Because again, you may discover something interesting that you didn't notice before um, when you're doing this. Uh, last thing that I wanted to show you real quick is some other uh, add-ons that are not available in... Um, not available in um, Firefox, but they are available in Chrome. If you log into Chrome, they've got uh, in their uh, uh, what do you call it? Their options section. They've got extensions as well. And right now, I'm looking at their extensions, and they've got a lot of these cool extensions that only work in again in here. And they've got a lot of neat things. And if you look down here, they've got something for uh, where'd you go? something for education. And so you've got all these education things that you can add on. Um, you've got a translator, you've got a typing test, a book void. Um, these are just some things, another translator, English vocabulary. And these things you can add on to Chrome. PBS Play, TOEFL practice, free TOEFL practice. You've got stuff for foreign languages or at teacher administration tools. And this is if you're in Chrome. Now, Firefox has many similar things, uh, but some of these things that are here are actually companies making these as opposed to more of the open source things. And uh, so you have to pay for some of these. But there's a lot of neat tools that sit here in Chrome as well. Again, they only work in Chrome. They don't work in Firefox. So for Firefox, they have a whole bunch of extensions and things for language as well. Um, but so does Chrome. So I just want to let you know that those are the two major ones that are out there. There are other browsers that have them. Internet Explorer has some. Um, Opera, which you probably never heard of, has more. Um, but there are a number of uh, browsers out there that have these uh, add-ons or these extensions that you can use. And uh, that's all I have for this particular uh, this particular video. If you do have any questions, you can shoot me a, a message down below or send me an email. And I'd be happy to respond to you. You guys have a nice day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye now.